your birth stands the lady with the torch raised to the sky and all who see her know she stands for liberty for you and me I'm so proud to be called an American to be named with the brave and the free I will honor our flag and our trust in God and the statue stood across with my Lord raised to the sky and all who knew there live forever as all the saved can testify I'm so glad to be called a Christian to be named with the ransom and whole as a statute liberates the sin so the cross liberates the soul Oh, the cross is my statute of liberty It was there that my soul was set free statute of liberty unashamed I'll proclaim that a rugged cross is my statute of liberty Thank you for that. Let's stand this morning. First Samuel, please, for the reading of the scripture. First Samuel chapter number 17. First Samuel chapter number 17. We're going to read quite a number of verses this morning. We're going through this chapter for our summer series, Is There Not a Cause? Okay, facing the giants in our lives. 1 Samuel chapter 17, and we'll start in verse number 12. <clears throat> Excuse me. 1 Samuel chapter 17, and we'll start in verse number 12. It says, Now David was the son of the Ephraimite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, and he had eight sons. And <clears throat> the man went among men for an old man in the days of Saul. And the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to the battle. And the names of the sons that went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and next unto him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. And David was the youngest, and the three eldest followed Saul. But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And the Philistine drew near morning and evening, 
and presented himself 40 days. We saw that last week, how he defied the armies and threatened them and so forth. Um, verse number 17, And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn and these ten loaves, and run to the camp of the brethren. And carries these ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousand, and look how they how thy brethren fare, and take their pledge. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. <clears throat> David rose up in the morning, early in the morning, and left the sheep with a keeper, and took and went as Jesse had commanded him, and he came to the trench. And as the host was going forth to the fight and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words. And David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him. And were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel as he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches, and will give him his daughter, and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? The people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou down thither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart. For thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, What have I done now? Is there not a cause? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the time we can be here this morning. Bless our, bless our short time together, Lord. Help us to get what you have for us from your word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Of course, the, our series is from the story of David facing Goliath. And that was a mismatch. On paper, you always say that. It's a mismatch on paper. There's a guy that's nine feet tall. He's got armor. and He's armored up from top to bottom. He's got weapons. He's got people to help. And, uh, and he's talking trash, and he's just letting them have it. And they were afraid. We saw that last week. We saw that the giant Israel, and we face giants in our life also, don't we? People, um, as we... By way of introduction, people throughout our, our, the ages have always been selfish. We are, we're naturally selfish. It's just something we fight. It's in our flesh. We think about our, ourselves first. We all struggle with it. Really, selfishness at its core is nothing more than, than just pride. And pride is something we have to deal with. Whenever we are selfish, life is only about ourselves. <clears throat> with our modern technology... All of the fun stuff that's out there to do. Life is even more about us today than it ever has been or ever will be. Social media can be about keeping up with others, but how often does it turn out to be solely about us? We want everybody to know what I'm doing. We want every, everybody to know what I like. We want everybody to know where I'm at. And we want everybody to know how I'm feeling. And uh, I'm not saying there's anything necessarily wrong, but, but it just seems like social media just kind of unleashes our inner selfishness. And you say, well, I'm not selfish. It's not about me. Well, if you have an Instagram account, look at it and see how many pictures are you. Not you with somebody else, but you, you know. We take the picture. Here's me eating pizza, you know. <laughs> okay, well, the pizza's, a, pizza's not a person. That doesn't count. Uh, but all that stuff we do, and it's just, it's about ourselves, if we're not, if we're really honest. We're trying to portray something, that our life is this, and Instagram is only showing the good times, it doesn't show the bad times. Our philosophies of life also are bordering around ourselves. My comfort, my happiness, my times, my feeling, my space, 
But to be honest with you, if life is going to be what it should be for us, it ought to be bigger than ourselves. A life that's just about ourselves is a life that's headed for problems. You can read the book of Ecclesiastes and you read about Solomon. and Solomon seemed to have it all. He had money. He had wisdom. He had stuff. He had wives, multiple wives, multiple, multiple wives. He had everything he wanted. He had power. He had prestige. And yet, if you read the beginning of Ecclesiastes, you get a bit confused. It's like, what? I'm, I'm getting depressed with him. Because that stuff never brings happiness. You look at chapter 1 and chapter 2 and how often he talks about himself and uses the word I and all the stuff that he wanted. And yet he says that he hated life because a life lived for self leads to a life that is miserable. He had no purpose. That was his issue. Nothing bigger than him. Now as we get to the text and we pick up where we left off last week, we see the giants real. Last week he came and he gave his little spiel. You know, come, fight with me. They, you imagine for 40 days what they would do. The armies would get up and they would line up across from each other. And then all of a sudden, here comes Goliath, nine feet tall. Very imposing figure. And he'd come to them and he'd, he'd go through his little spiel. Give me a man. We'll fight. Whoever wins, they're the winner. And Israel would always back down. That's about to change in the coming weeks, but particularly today. Nobody in the Jewish army had volunteered to stand up and fight him, including King Saul, who stood head and shoulders above all his men. Saul was the guy. Saul should have been the one to step up. Fortunately, uh, this morning, David was there, and he happened to get up early, and he's following his father's command to bring food to his brothers, which would not be unusual because in those days, some of the armies, they didn't provide all the provisions, and so you would have your own provisions brought in, and so that's what's happening, and David just happens to go, and he gets there early, and he sees them lined up, and he runs over there to talk to his brothers because obviously a battle wasn't happening, and as he was there, here comes Goliath, the big mouth, again, and he starts talking, and he starts making his threats. Saul had even offered, look, you know, if someone will fight this guy, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll make his family free, tax-free. I'll even give him my daughter, which could be a blessing depending on, 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 on how she was. If it was Michael, I think David found out later that was a bad move. But Saul was hoping someone else would step up and fight him. Well, there was one. He wasn't even part of the army. His name was David. David's response to Goliath's arrogant speech was that of total disgust. He's thinking, who is this Philistine to step up and blaspheme the name of our God and his army? Think about this as we look through it. David was the youngest of Saul's sons, and only the, top, only the three oldest of Saul's sons were in, the back, were, were in the army. David wasn't even old enough to be in the army, but that didn't matter to him. There was something that needed to be done. You imagine David as he's going out here and he's talking to his brothers and here comes Goliath and Goliath gives the, the speech and then he witnesses everybody running away in fear, including King Saul. But David was not about to do that. We know the story. As we will see next week, David has no problem volunteering for the job, even though it was dangerous. Even though that others were not concerned about what the giant was doing. Even though no one else would step forward. Even though the leader was afraid. We're going to see when we look next week. David didn't have a problem with any of that. He knew something needed to be done. David was different. Everything that had happened in his life, he used to prepare him for this time. God's going to use him. But I want us to notice two things before we look next week at the battle that helped prepare David to be ready to fight this fella that everybody else was afraid of. First of all, I want you to notice the making of a warrior. By the way, David was a warrior. David was not afraid. David was willing to fight the battles for God. It didn't just happen as he saw Goliath and he had his righteous indignation. 
You see, there were things that happened in his life to prepare him for this time that were to get him to the place where he would be the one to stand up for God. Everything that happens in our life, God can use to get us to where he wants us to be and for us to accomplish what he wants us to accomplish. The good things and the bad things. But so often what happens, we struggle with some of the things that God brings into our life. And if we're not careful, we actually fight against them. When it, even if they're unpleasant, God can use those to make us what he wants us to be. Whenever something unpleasant comes in our life, there's two really choices we have. We can refuse to learn what God has for us, and if we do that, we'll get bitter. Or we can learn the lessons that God tries to teach us through those things, and when we learn those lessons, it will make us better. Well, that's what David did. What were the things that happened in David's life that helped him to become everything that he was and be ready to fight Goliath? Well, first... We see that there was some training with his family, his upbringing. It always starts with the family. David was there, and there were things his father would have him do, and he did it very obediently. Go into the battle, take him to his brothers. Everything, look, so often that we try to use the things that happen to us in our families that as excuses for what we cannot do. Isn't it always the case? Well, you don't understand me. I grew up in a, a dysfunctional family. Well, get in line. We're all dysfunctional, okay? There's no perfect. If you have a perfect family, please come let me know. I'd like to meet them. There is no perfect family. Now, I understand some families, there's, there's things that happen that are even, I get it, that are worse than other families. But let me just tell you something. If you know God, everything that happens in your family, God can use and will use to make you uniquely what he wants you to be so he can use you for that specific purpose he has for your life. Don't fight it. Don't get bitter about it. And that's what happened to David. God uses our upbringing. God uses the situations of life that happen to us. So often it's, you know, we, we can either use things that happen in our, our life, they can be a chain to hold us down. By the way, a lot of people do that. You don't understand the, you know, I have baggage. Okay, everybody has baggage. I know some's worse than the other. Some is worse than others. Well, listen, don't let that chain you down to the future. Why are you going to let whatever happened in the past chain you down and keep you from being what you should be? Why don't you see how God can use that to chisel you and make you what he wants you to be? We see also the tending of the sheep, the work. David was taught discipline at a very young age. Here he is out with the, out with the, the flocks. And we're going to see later on that uh, there was some issues he had to deal with. But he learned diligence. <clears throat> By the way, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with being diligent and working a little bit. We, the, you know, the reason we have a soft society is because our, our, we, we couldn't produce another David. If, if it was our day and David saw the Philistine, he'd probably go try to get a lawyer and sue him. He hurt my feelings. I need a safe space. You know what? They all needed a safe space, and as soon as he cut off Goliath's head, they were all safe. But we're too soft. You know, we pamper our children. We don't want them to do anything, and, and the first time they whine, we, oh, listen, that, that's not how it works. Let's teach them. Understand that in our children's life, the Giants are coming. We need to be ready to fight them. I heard a story about a man. He was in his 20s. He was a Christian man. I heard this many years ago on, on some radio show. <clears throat> he was working in an office. His, his, he, was, he was in his early 20s, 20. And what had happened is a man came in. He was, him and his wife had separated, and the man came in with a gun and was going to shoot his wife. He saw what was happening and how it was escalating, and so he just instinctively protected the young lady, went over there and tried to get involved, and, and, and a scuffle happened, and the man ended up shooting him and killing him. Later on, the lady, trying to cover for her husband, tried to tell a lie, saying that the reason that happened is because uh, the, the, hus the husband saw him trying to do something to the wife and, and was protecting her. Now, fortunately for this, this Christian young man, although he was 
dead, he, they, there was enough witnesses there that the, they found out the lady was lying. But as they interviewed the parents, of course they were sad. They, but I remember they made a comment. They said, listen, he goes, we're not shocked that he would have stood up like that because we always taught him to come to defense of people and to help people. And so he was just instinctively doing what he had been taught to do, to help somebody. You know, we just, we raise, we're just so soft in our society. We don't want to help anybody and we want to be pampered. David was not pampered. By the way, if you're pampered, there's going to be a time in life when something's coming your way, you're going to have to face it. And you're not going to be prepared for it at all. But David wasn't like that. Don't be a snowflake, you know. We have spiritual snowflakes too. And then I want you to notice the timing of the request. By the way, it wasn't a coincidence that David just happened to show up when Goliath was running his mouth. I mean, it just seemed like, you know, hey, it's time to take the boy some food. David, go take, some, take your brother some food and drop it off. And he actually even gave cheese to the commander and he had the whole nine yards. And just so happens, what a coincidence, he shows up and he sees, he sees Goliath coming this way. No, God had that all planned out. God, God, God has that. God puts us in the places we're supposed to be when we're supposed to be there. Everything that happens in our life, the timing, God puts us there for a reason. It's almost like Esther when she became queen and, and all the Jews are going to be exterminated. And she was kind of afraid. And Mordecai said, you know, you need to understand, did God put you there for such a time as this? God uses the situations of life to get us to where we're supposed to be. If we are who we are supposed to be for God, we will get to where we should be. So all this thing, David looks at his past. He's been prepared for this time. But I want you to notice, secondly, and most importantly, I want you to see the discovery of a cause. David is now prepared. And pep preparation is important. But if David was going to be what God wanted him to be, he needed to take that preparation and he needed to plug it into a greater purpose. It wasn't for him. God was going to use him for something greater than himself. See, preparation gets us ready, but purpose gets us, purpose gets us going. David's army, that he, the army that he saw, they were paralyzed. But David wasn't paralyzed. He wanted to pursue this guy and take him down. Why? Because David found a cause. David knew there was something bigger than himself. Do you know God has a purpose for every single person's life? He has a cause. He has something that he wants you to do in your life. He has something he wants you to accomplish, and it's more than just about ourselves. See, that selfish society just kind of ties us in. It's only about me, and God's like, no, no, no. There's something greater out there. There's something more I want you to be plugged in. There, plugged into. There's something more I want you to be in tune with, and that is our cause. That prompts us to action. That prompts us to be willing to sacrifice. But if we're going to really accomplish anything, we need to understand our purpose in life, our cause, must be connected to God. It's got to be. David didn't just stand up and say, this guy is a, is a jerk. I know some moves. I've been trained. I'll just take this guy down and shut him up. Now, that would have been okay with me. But David said, the reason he needs to be stopped is he's, be, he's defying my God. And it's almost when David is saying that, like, do any of you other guys hear this? Do any of you other guys get what's going on here? You don't hear him uh, uh, talking bad about our God, talking bad about our, our God's armies? Because I hear it. His purpose was connected to God, not just the fight and the battle that was at hand. He wanted to shut him up because he was blaspheming since his God. Do you know the eternal causes are the only ones that last? Too many people have their life tied into something that's not really that important. Oh, there's causes. Save the whales. Okay? 
Save the trees. Save this. Save the environment. Global warming. You name it. Now, I'm not for blowing up the environment, okay? But, I, but listen, I'm not going to worship the earth. I don't like pollution, but we've gone a little bit too far. Okay? I think the whales are doing pretty good. Pretty good. We ought to have a cause that's greater than something like that. We're saved. Why don't we have an eternal cause? When we get to heaven, God's going to say, how many whales did you save? So I don't know. I ate a few, but I don't know how many we saved. By the way, why don't we save the chickens? Okay? I'm an eggs right activist. I'm not for cruelty to animals, all that. But I'm saying, we need to have something that's great. Why don't we tie it to the eternal? That could involve God's commission. You know, we talk about going out to summer saturation. Why, why do we go out? What we're doing is we're going to our community to let them know about Jesus Christ. We're going out to the, our community to say, hey, there are answers to life. They're found in God's word. You say, but I wouldn't know how to talk to somebody about God. Then come. Come with us. We'll teach you. And by the way, it's not as hard as you think it is. People aren't, you know, you don't go out there, people are meeting, they're not. They're, most of the time, they'll, they'll at least take an invitation. It's not that hard. But how are they going to know about God if someone doesn't take up the cause and tell them? Maybe it involves our children and families. We need the next generation. Too much nonsense going on in our world. The stuff our children are being fed is just ridiculous. We need a cause. Maybe it's God's calling on your life. How did David find his cause? Let me give you a couple of thoughts and we're done. You know, David found his cause while he was serving. He was the oldest, not young enough, and so he ended up being his brother's lunch truck. Think about that. How did you find your cause? Well, one day, I was taking lunch to my brother's, and I guarantee it wasn't McDonald's either. Okay? It was something healthy. And I went there, and as I was there, I saw what was going on, and I knew I needed to be involved. I had to do something. He was serving. As he was fulfilling his duty, he saw the giant. And he didn't just see him as a giant. He saw him as an opportunity to take down one of God's en en enemies. We serve. I guarantee you, you ask anybody, who, 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 who works for God full-time. Not, not if you don't work for God full-time, you're a second-class citizen. I'm not. The point, how does that usually happen? You know, usually people, people get to serving, and we're all supposed to serve, by the way. But you get so involved, it's like, I'd kind of like to do this full-time. I kind of just want to do this with my life. Serving helps you to find your purpose. Because, see, when you're serving, you're not just worried about yourself. You're out getting involved with other people. And when you go out and you get involved in other people, you find something that's greater than yourself. That's why, by the way, we encourage our teenagers to get out on our bus routes. And some of our bus routes go into rougher areas, and, and to be honest with you, they hear words and things that, that uh, they don't hear around our house. Now, they might hear it around my in-law's house, but not our house. You know, our kids would come home and say, ah, I saw a kid, and mother was saying this. They, they say, well, man, I don't want them seeing that stuff. I do. I want them to go out there and see what happens when people are away from God or when people don't know God. I want them to get a cause to say, why don't I bring the Lord to people that don't know him? There has to be a cause. It happens when we're serving. If you've been here any amount of time, you ought to find something to do in the church. You ought to be involved in some way because that's a greater purpose. We're not just here. Now we're outside of ourselves. Our bus workers going out, they find this. They see the cause. Our Sunday school teachers, our nursery workers, our choir, our orchestra. When we're serving God, we find that cause. He also found it in speaking. He heard Goliath for himself. And as soon as Goliath spoke, he realized that this guy cannot go unchallenged. He just can't. I love these people, and I know they're well-meaning, and I'm not getting on them, but, you know, um, love, not war. Think peace. And by the way, I'm not for war for the sake of war at all. But, you know, it's kind of hard to think peace when someone's got you on the ground beating your head. 
at that point, they don't need peace. They need a piece of pipe upside their head. Amen. They need a piece of your knuckle in their mouth. Okay, if someone is bound and determined to fight, you have no choice. I'm not saying let's go start fights, but David wasn't looking for a fight that day. He just happened to go there and says, this guy wants to fight. It's going to have to happen. Someone's going to do it. I might as well just do it. He's talking about, my God, I'm not, I'm not going to let this go unchallenged. Why don't we take the challenge? There are so many challenges in, in this life. There's so much that God wants us to accomplish in our community. There's so much that God wants us to accomplish in this world. But someone's got to take the challenge. Someone's got to say, I see the need and, 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 and I'm going to go for it. That means we, help, we can't be able to live for ourselves. Also in seeing. David saw the cause in seeing. David saw the effect that the giant was having on the enemies of God. He went out there. I mean, these are armies. You would, I think, you know, it, it was 40 days of the same thing. Getting up. Lining up. Everybody's in formation. Everybody's ready to fight. Here he comes. Ah, there they go. And David sees this. And he says, people are running in fear. Something needs to be done. How often in life do we not see the need? See, we're so busy in life, we can't see the need. It's like if you read Lamentations. Lamentations is that small book right after Jeremiah. The book of Jeremiah talks about the coming judgment of God on their nation. That Babylon's going to come and destroy their nation and ruin their Jerusalem and just leave the poorest people of the land and carry everybody off, off hostage, the ones they didn't kill. And Jeremiah, after the war's over, after everybody's been taken, there's only some poor, poor, poor folks left uh, foraging for food and everything's destroyed and everybody's destitute. And Jeremiah's walking through the city and he sees all that happened, all the bad stuff, the, the children that are in misery. And no one cared. And he said, is it nothing to you, all you that pass by? Don't you see it? Don't we see it? Don't we see the needs? Don't we see? Listen, one reason we need to grow in our faith is so we can help others find Christ and have a faith and a Christian life also. It's got to happen that way. Listen, if you're new to church, we want you to come and we want you to grow. We want you to, to learn and we want you to be blessed. But we don't want you to be blessed just so you can sit around and be blessed. We want you to be blessed so we can go out and reach someone else and help them to be blessed. We don't want you to come and just hear the truth so you have the truth. We want you to come and hear the truth so you can go out and share it with those that don't have it. How selfish is it of us to know Christ, to know the truth, to know what can change our life and what can, what can bring real lasting joy and yet be quiet about it and never lift a finger to help someone else to get it. we got to have a cause. And lastly, we see there was a cause in standing. David just says, I'm standing up. We're going to see next week, he goes to Saul and says, hey Saul, don't worry about it. I'm going to take this guy down. But Saul gets a little confused about that, and I think he's a little convicted about it too. He should have been the one doing it. But David said, no one else is standing. The right thing to do is always the right thing to do. Right? Oh, but I, I, it doesn't matter. Stand. And David saw it. Listen, let me ask you this morning. We're done. What are you living for? What is the cause in your life? Is it connected to the Lord? A good cause to just say, Lord, I want to honor and glorify you, and I'm going to do everything I can to follow your two greatest commands. I'm going to love you, and I'm going to love others. You know, and I know depression is real, and there's some th medical and some other things that can cause it, but sometimes, sometimes we get down simply because life is just about us. Sometimes we get discouraged because we're only thinking about ourselves. Now, I'm not saying you don't need to fight that, but I'm saying one way to fight it is you fight it on this side, but on the other side, go help somebody else. On the other side, find out what God wants you to be a part of. 
Find out what God wants you to accomplish and jump in. Then you know what? Life's not just about you. I feel sorry for people that have no cause in life. Their life is just about making it. And by the way, we need to. Going through the week, going to your job, getting your money, paying your bills, just trying to survive, just trying to make it. I know we need to do that. But you know there's more to life than that. We've got to find our purpose, and our purpose is found in following God. Yeah, there'll be battles, but, you know, there's no victories without battles. Find your cause. There's more to it. Let's stand this morning, please.